promised us that he would be a kind. Well, hello once again, and welcome to Carrier of His Presence broadcast. I am Elder Jesse Darrow, and I do appreciate you tuning in today to listen to another broadcast that I hope will be very, very edifying and strengthening and even challenging you to another place in the Lord. As I thought about what am I going to talk about today, something that crossed my mind that I know was a blessing to me, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you as well, was that it is time for the church of God to seek after a supernatural encounter with our Lord and Savior. This is beyond just salvation, but this is, when I say a supernatural encounter, I'm talking about beyond normal, beyond typical, beyond just assembling on Sundays, and beyond the clapping of the hands, and beyond maybe a praise dance or just a witness and a testimony. But I have specific reference to a supernatural encounter with the God of our creation. And I think something that really encouraged my heart to begin to seek after the supernatural more than just status quo living, uh, my sister-in-law, we got a phone call that she was not doing well. And the doctors had pretty much said that any day now, because her heart was so weakened, that the family needed to get together and discuss uh, maybe even having a funeral. I mean, they did not, the doctors did not say that specifically, but that was the implication. Well, going from day to day, you know, I uh, got that report, and so I began to pray. So, you know, Christians are really, really quick to pray. So I began to pray. But what I prayed was more for the family unity and the family getting together and being supportive and loving and kind to one another, but not God raising her up. Because I had heard the report that because her heart was weakened and there was a strong possibility that she would not make it but for a few more days, I accepted that report. And you know, I came under such strong conviction. A lady was visiting here from out of town and she wanted to come by to visit with me. And my husband and I were sharing, it was my, it's my husband's sister, and we were sharing with this lady the report of the doctor. And I'll tell you, if this lady was not fiery and excited and she was saying, no, we're going to decree some things over uh, 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 Louise's life, that was my husband's sister's name, we're going to decree some things over her life. And, and I began to listen to her talk. And you know, I realized I had dropped the ball. I am so busy doing good works and doing status quo living that I realized that I had forgotten how important it is to believe God beyond the natural and believe him for some of the supernatural acts that we can read about in his word. So I have three questions that I thought that I would start out asking, and I, I want to really, really uh, talk to those who have a yes answer to these three questions. Do you feel a spiritual void in your life. Right now, today, do you feel a spiritual void in your life? Number two, do you know in your heart that there is more to this Christian journey than what you are experiencing right now? Number three, can you believe that there is a link between the supernatural acts of the first century church and the same potential for the 21st century church. Man, I hope that many of you have said yes. If you're listening, I really hope that you've said yes to all three of those questions. 
And this is the reason why. Do you feel a spiritual void in your life? A lot of our spiritual voids come from the, 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 just the everyday getting into the routine of getting up, praying, reading the word of God, assembling on Sunday. And I think that many of us, and, and, and I must admit that I'm guilty on a level uh, uh, of that as well, that I think that sometimes we forget to seek the Lord for another supernatural encounter of his spirit. Now think about this. Can you remember after all of the apostles and the disciples walked with Jesus and followed Jesus and listened to our Lord for three and a half years, after he died, they became so discouraged that when the word came to them that he was raised from the dead, they did not believe that. They did not believe that report. Now, now think about what, I'm, what I just said. They walked with him for three and a half years. So we can read the Bible, Jesus, the word made flesh. We can read this word and believe it intellectually that what we're reading is the truth. But then something happens that is so devastating, and we want to know, well, God, where are you? And I imagine that the, the apostles are saying, you know, you know, he's dead, he's in the grave, he's dead, he's done. Even though they had to have heard him say, I am the resurrection and the life. And though I am, yet though I will die, yet will I live again. I know they heard him say that. I know they've heard him say so many times over and over again that for this cause came I into the world. I've got to go, uh, but I'm going to come again. All of these reports that they heard about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, they heard it intellectually. You know, I believe that's where we are today. We hear intellectually, and it's very satisfying, but we are not being sustained under pressure because the pressure came to the apostles and the disciples of Jesus when they saw him hanging on Calvary. And from my understanding, just what little bit of understanding I have had from the scriptures and just the historical content of what actually happened during a crucifixion, it looked like he was dead as well as done. But you know, our faith have got to be raised beyond what is acceptable today, what is common and what we're so accustomed to, that we're actually beginning to seek the Lord for a supernatural encounter with him. That each day we get up, that there is that anticipation. Because you know, after encountering this lady, she came in my living room and I tell you, I felt so empowered. I felt, first of all, convicted because I had dropped the ball of, of believing the Lord that he is still the resurrection and the life. But I felt so inspired, too, because I had purposed in my heart and my husband, Freddie, purposed in his heart that we were going to go down. Uh, we, she's in Arkansas. That we were going to go to Arkansas and we were going to do some damage in the kingdom of darkness that I don't even think after that encounter with her and after we talked that there was a doubt in his mind that God was not going to move supernaturally in his sister's life. So we got our plan together. We got our game plan together. We went down. She is not 100% out of the woods, but when he say lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, recovery can be instant and or it can be a progressive recovery. I don't care as long as she recovers. Amen. So it's like we left Flint, glory be to God, going to Arkansas, anticipating a mighty move of the Spirit of God because I was so mindful that after Christ was crucified, the disciples lost heart. They became discouraged. Is this man that was walking had all this power who had legions of angels at his disposal, and he gave himself over to be crucified. So I can imagine, and that was disheartening, because if you think about it, you look at our everyday life, and we fast forward to uh, today. There's things that we scratch our head. Lord, 
How do you allow someone to go in and shoot up people who are worshiping? It doesn't matter they are not worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but how is this allowed? So people have to scratch their heads, but we still have to believe in the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, that regardless of what's taking place on earth, there's things that God does himself, there's things that God allows, and why he allows it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that he is still God. So then, if we fill the spiritual void in our lives, I would say examine your thought life because after Jesus appeared to the disciples, their heart was encouraged, and their heart was encouraged enough to go to the upper room and wait on the promise of the Father. And these apostles and disciples were so filled with the Spirit that they turned Jerusalem upside down with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And I think that we're at that time now to where we've got to begin to fill this void with a higher expectation of who our God is, that we continue to seek more readily a supernatural experience with our Lord. Now, this is not going to happen just by fly by night. This takes discipline. First of all, it takes passion. There has to be a passion in our heart for more. That's number one, that we want more of God. You know, in my opinion, it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to get lazy. It's easy to get satisfied with just uh, getting up, saying a quick prayer, equivalent to now lay me down to sleep, but not to actually sit in the presence of God and wait until we hear his voice. Just spend time basking in the knowledge of knowing that not only isn't he in us, but he'll also come upon us and prepare us for each day. One of the things that I enjoy doing is starting out my day listening to praise tapes. Sometimes I just get up early and I like to read. Sometimes I just like to lay, meditate, pray for different people and things. But the thing is that I'm fortifying my heart and my spirit for the supernatural because I want the void in my life filled. I do know that there's more that God has for me, and I do know that I'm going to touch many more lives than what I am touching right now. So I do not want to feel a spiritual void in my life because now I am seeking God for a supernatural encounter. Amen? The second question I asked you was, do you know in your heart that there is more to the Christian journey than what you are experiencing now? In other words, that every uh, supernatural act that's in the, Bi in the Bible and I'm specifically going to be coming out of Acts, the third chapter, the fourth chapter, and the fifth chapter. And the reason those three chapters are so important to me, when I was a younger convert and I saw the boldness of these apostles, and I saw the boldness of these disciples standing up against the status quo, I was astounded, and I had no idea at all that by and by, that there were many things that the Lord would have me to take righteous stands against. Because being young, I'm just reading, and it's intellectual knowledge. But as I began to seek the Lord, and I was encouraged to pray, to come to Bible study, uh, to, to read frequently, and et cetera, and et cetera, and I obeyed, I began to grow and desire more of God. But I was all, I began to wonder, and I was always seemed like I was uh, astounded at the fact that what the first century church was doing and what the 21st century church was doing, well, at that time it was the 20th century church, but the 21st century church now, there seemed to be a great gulf fixed between those two experiences. And so what I did learn was that I need to know in my heart and you need to know in your heart 
to there's more. It's not going to come just continuing status quo, uh, picking up the Bible on Sunday morning and bringing it to church for a show, having to dust it off because it has sit there from one Sunday to the next Sunday. It is the word. It is the word that empowers us. And, you know, when I get into the uh, third, fourth, and fifth chapters of Acts, you're going to see something that it took me several years to see. And one of those things was what angered the religious leaders, the high priests, the elders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Do you know what angered them was? Not that they, the, the apostles and the disciples were healing, but it was in whose name that they were healing. Now, now understand this now. This is important, that when I say name, name and character and authority can be used interchangeably. What I mean by that is when I say in the name of Jesus, I am saying in the character of Jesus. I'm saying in the authority of Jesus. The first century church knew that they had the character of Jesus and they had the authority of Jesus and they worked it well to where people were uh, brought to them and uh, 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 the scriptures sh uh, tells us that Peter's shadow was healing. They were turning Jerusalem upside down with this doctrine of Jesus Christ that they were preaching messages of deliverance and repentance. And so many souls were saved back then. This is powerful stuff. And the reason I can say it's a supernatural move of God, because Sunday after Sunday, someone may come and want to know what can they do to be saved. But apparently the messages of Peter and John and Paul, all the apostles were so powerful that people were saved instantaneously this is a powerful message that whatever uh the holy spirit has given that there's such a mighty move of the spirit that people are saved instantaneously so I, i'm i'm just i'm seeking i'm seeking right now i'm a seeker i am a seeker of the supernatural i am a seeker now of a supernatural encounter with god and so in believing that, if you hear that Jesse Darrow was ascended back to heaven on a chariot of fire, or if you see Jesse Darrow brighten up and being transformed like the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, or anything that is supernatural, I am very, very serious. I am anticipating the Lord doing something very supernatural, and not in my life but I mean in the life of the church of Jesus Christ because I believe, and when you read the scriptures, many believe because of the miracles that were done. Many believe because of the miracles. You know, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you in the last broadcast, but I'm talking about supernatural. Uh, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, I had to have my annual mammogram and so I went to the doctor after having the mammogram the lady came and said that the doctor saw a spot that she wanted to uh, have me to come back to have an ultrasound and to have a biopsy to find out if this was cancerous and you know honest to God I am not playing with this one I could not receive that I had cancer and so someone that have had cancer is saying, well, I didn't receive it either, but I had it. When I say I did not receive the fact that I have cancer, I don't eat right all the time, but I eat right often. I take herbs, and I, above that, I love sincerely. I am very forgiving. I stay at peace. There's a lot that we do to the body that helps cancer, uh, I guess, become alive in our body, however it comes alive, and to spread. And I hope no one misunderstands me. 
I am just saying life from my perspective. This is not to say anyone that has cancer. Uh, that's because they're full of hatred. And uh, Please don't twist my words. What I mean is, is that I love the Lord and I believe in a supernatural uh, move of him in my life. That is what I'm saying. And so when uh, that word was spoken to me, I didn't receive it. I refused to believe that cancer was in my life, in my body. So I went and I had the biopsy. And there was just this pinpoint of a spot that the doctor was concerned about. So I'm laying on the table, and the lady that was doing the ultrasound said, the nurse said, did that spot just disappear? The doctor said, I don't see it. Now, I don't have to tell you that I felt like getting up, le leaping, jumping, and, and praising God. But I laid there and I smiled. Because, why? Because I believe that our God is a supernatural God. And just status quo living will never be satisfactory to me. I believe in filling the void in my life so that each day I can feel the presence of God, that I feel a proactive uh, reality in my life so that when I am called to someone's bedside, I go believing that God is going to move supernaturally. If someone calls and they are hurting, I believe God is going to move supernaturally to give me a word that is going to destroy some yoke of bondage. So let us raise our level. I, 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 I dropped the ball on one, on one uh, uh, case, but I don't intend to drop the ball again because now my conscience has been raised more and more that we have to seek God and believe him daily, daily, for supernatural encounters with his spirit. But I got to move on to number three. I don't want to end the broadcast before I get to number three. Number three, the question is, can you believe that there is a link between the first century church's supernatural acts and the same potential for the third century church? Do you believe that? Do you believe that uh, uh, we have to establish a tent of meaning, of meeting? You know, there was a place that Moses would go to and God would meet with him. Or an altar in the home, a place where you know you can just go and talk to the Lord and, and feel his presence and feel his power. My husband and I had gotten in the habit of at the foot of our bed, there is um, like, it's like a little bench. It's not exactly a bench, but it's something that I bought many, 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 many years ago. Solid wood. It is strong and it is mighty and it allows us to lean on it and pray together. And that is like a tent of meeting to me. It is a place where I expect to experience the presence of God. So in doing that, I am looking forward to more and more and more supernatural acts coming from our Lord and, and Savior Jesus Christ. So if you will remember that it's important for the church of the living God to begin to seek the Lord beyond just a minor daily prayer, two or three scriptures being read, and Sunday praise and worship, that there is this expectation that the God of our salvation is going to do great and mighty things in our lives. And since I did not get anywhere near as far as I really have planned, there will be a part two to this particular teaching. But I do want to leave this thought in your mind. Will you move beyond where you are now and seek the Lord daily for a supernatural encounter that he can fill the spiritual void in your life, that you can believe that the same power that the first century church had, that you have it as well. Amen. 
So Paul Herring have given me my cue. He's letting me know that it's about time to end the broadcast. I do really appreciate you tuning in this week. I hope that you will tune in next week as well and listen to part two as we seek a supernatural encounter with the Lord. At the end of the broadcast, you will see that I have underwriters. Johnny Pearson from Visionary Solutions today, Carol Lewis, who is a Cadillac Realty, and my husband, Freddie Darrow, Paul Herring, who's also a supporter. You probably don't know that I do because he does a lot of extra things for me that I don't pay him for, but just to make me shine, to make me look good. promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and a Prince of Peace. He promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that Cease. I tried him and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell. Just what Jesus means to me. For he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive, more wonderful than my heart can believe. Goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for, everything God promised. And so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is. To me, I stand amazed to think the King of Glory would come to live within the heart of man. I marvel just to know. That he loves me when I think of who he is and who I am. For he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. And my heart can believe he goes beyond.